are on the second chapter of Second Nephi, <clears throat> perhaps the hardest chapter in the book as far as that goes. And uh, wait a minute, I better get some notes here. It's about the law. Now, the law of Moses. We've often said that the Nephites were living, well, if my paper home doesn't make any difference, were living by the law of Moses. I George, I did. But we're often told, they're often repeatedly reassured that salvation does not come by the law of Moses. We used to think we need notes anyway. And then what, why is there so much fuss about it? Of course, <coughs> it is the way that leads to, it's, it's the way that leads you, it, it guides you on the way. Uh, what's got me all going here, I've just been reading that, uh, the classic work on the subject of history of law by a sinologist who's also a scientist, and that's uh, Joseph Needham. And he goes to great extent, he goes all over Robin Hood's barn using every conceivable definition of law when the, when the word first appeared in the East, in the West, here, there, and everywhere. And uh, he, he decides that law is an idea that's limited to a very special type of culture and to a very, uh, and to a highly specialized organization of society, namely where you have a great emperor, a powerful king. He lays down the law. Without that, there's no law. There's, there's only custom and practice. Of what the, uh, what the, as I call it, the anthropologist got to calling mores at the beginning of the century. You do things a certain way. There's the way of doing things. So he makes a big fuss about that. And being a sinologist, he makes a big thing about, the, uh, about Confucius. He says, forget about the law. There's no law at all. You do the right thing. The princely man does so and so. There is the way, the proper way. And if Needham only realized it, all his work is just a quibble because we all have the same way. The, uh, there's a famous Newtonian hymn in the 18th century that goes, uh, <coughs> how does it go? Uh, worlds, praise the Lord, for he hath spoken. Worlds his sovereign word obeyed, his mighty word obeyed. Laws that never shall be broken for their guidance he has made. See, God has made words for the worlds. So now, this is written way back in the 18th century. It sounds like something by Orson Pratt, Brigham Young. Uh, get this unseemly object out of the way. Uh, yes, worlds his sovereign word obeyed, laws that never shall be broken for all the worlds, you see. And this is Newton. Newton discovered that. And this is the greatest scientist, many people think, who ever lived, as far as genius is concerned. So God has made laws which follow, and uh, we praise the Lord because, but, but for guidance, what does that mean? Well, the guidance is the Hedda of the, of the Quran. Incidentally, he never mentions that. That's very important. The Hedda, the guidance, is extremely important. People that live in the desert always want guidance, of course, as far as that's concerned. So for their guidance he has made, and uh, he also forgets a lot of other things. The difference that Solon, I remember our friend Solon at the beginning here, he makes a, quite a difference between ethos, the ethos, and he wrote a work called the Eunomia and Nomos. The work we quoted from about the wickedness of the people, their greed and so forth, and, and the injustice of their society, we, he called the eunomia, the proper nomia, the proper following of the rule. But a nomos, as the word shows, is same as the name. It's one has been declared, what has been declared, pronounced, whereas the ethos, ethics, is just what people do. See, an ethnos is the nation. It's the, not really the nation. That's the wrong thing. We say uh, the Gentiles, ethno, is, is the way it's translated in the New Testament. But uh, the, eth the ethos is the ethics, is just the customs and practices. We do things certain ways in our society. We wouldn't think of doing them other ways. If you did a thing the wrong way, got on the wrong side of a horse, that would be outrageous, for example. For weddings, for customs, for everything we do is controlled by these laws that nobody laid down, and never been declared, but in rural communities or in 
of course, they break down in the city and we have to go for laws and everything has to be written down. And we have become the most legalistic and the most litigious people in the world. I mean, and the city of Salt Lake has more lawyers per cubic inch than any other city in America. It does, really. has the highest percentage of lawyers. So we're stuck by the law. But the Book of Mormon tells us over and over again, the law is not going to save. Of course it's not. It's for their guidance he has made. It's the guidance is the head. And what is that with Confucius? It's the Tao. It's the way you follow. There's a way you're going to make no difference. It's just a quibble, whether it's written down. Now, the law, our word law, comes from L.A. law, the old Scandinavian word, the old Norse word, which was pronounced. See, this idea of it, it has, you have to have a built-up empire, and you have to have the emperor in charge doing it. He said, because that came with the uh, despots in the 17th century and so forth, and, uh, and with the Chinese emperors. As soon as the emperor took over, then you get the idea of law, which is not, not so at all. Because the law is what's pronounced from the Logberg. Uh, once a year, the whole community, the remains of these still stay in Iceland. You see the, it's a circle, they still have it in Switzerland. When you have an assembly of all the people, a, a great assembly, you're, you're summoned to the assembly. And from the top of the mountain, as Moses read the law, from the top of the mountain, our Norse ancestors, I say there's still, there's still law in Iceland, uh, would read the law, would read it or recite it. Well, they recited it from memory, see if you know it. And that was the Gothi who pronounced it. The Gothi, which means the God, the, the man speaking for God. He was a Gothi, the high priest. Uh, the king and the Gothi were often identical, but the high priest would, would pronounce it. Incidentally, our friend had nothing to say about Egypt either. So he skipped a lot of things. No, but the law is the guidance, and you have to have it to get there, but it is devised for our weakness. It, it caters to our weakness, and we have to have it. It's not the goal, it's the way that gets you there. See, it's like the iron rod. You cling to the iron rod, because I love iron rods. If I have an iron rod, I already have it made. We'll, we'll just keep the iron rod, and that's all. No, the iron rod is just to get you to the temple. It is not supposed to be the temple, not supposed to be the object. You don't stick to the law all the time. And so we have the Ten Commandments. Those are the laws of Moses. Ah, yes, you see, now here is the law, as far as this goes, the law. But it's written for barbarians. It's written for people not... As Paul tells us, now the, the best uh, clue to this whole thing, uh, which matches these various chapters in the Book of Mormon, is the 10th chapter of, uh, of he uh, Hebrews. In the Book of Hebrews, it's, it's beautifully explained. Fortunately, I brought that one along. Then I'd have to read from it. But, uh, yeah, I did. But now we have in this second chapter here, when we say the law is going to, to get you there, it's the law. But the Ten Commandments, what are they? Well, now look. Do you have to be told every day that you shouldn't kill, that you shouldn't lie, that you shouldn't commit adultery, uh, that you shouldn't uh, bear false witness? Do you have to be reminded of that? No. The time comes, the Lord says, when the law is written in their hearts. You won't have to be, only a savage would have to be, a barbarian would have to be told, oh, now you mustn't kill anybody today. But we still have to be told that and reminded of these. And we think if we've kept the law, then we are saved. That's all there is to it. That's not it at all. That's where it begins. This is the least requirement. It starts out with the word of wisdom. Do I have to tell people every day, well, don't go out and get drunk? Well, we don't have to be told that. Even smoking now, people are warned about that. We don't have to go to the word of wisdom for that. One, uh, some of you, most of you, would never think of doing those things. They don't recur to you because, as it says, when it's given to us in the 87th section, this is adapted to the weakest of all saints. This is the lowest requirement. This is the mere beginning. This is the least thing that can be expected of you, is the word of wisdom. It says we start with that. The same thing with tithing. And so then you get to the, uh, so that you get to the Ten Commandments. And then when the Lord is asked to, what is the first and great commandment? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy might, mind, and strength. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor on the, as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the laws and the prophets. Well, if you love the Lord with all your heart, might, mind, and strength, and if you loved your fellow men that much, you're not going to go out and murder, and you're not going to go and steal. You don't need any of the commandments at all. Those two cover the whole thing. Obviously, don't they? Because you'll do what's right. As... Isaiah, Jeremiah say, the law is written in your heart. You wouldn't think of doing it. It's part of you. It's part of you. But again, it just is going to lead you where you're going to go. Of course, that's the purpose of the law. And you see, so atonement is way up there. Now, it's a very interesting thing in the, in the, in the Hebrews, because the Hebrews were still living by the law, you see. Paul has to tell them, the temple hadn't fallen yet, uh, Paul has to tell them uh, about these things, and they're... Uh, what he talks about, this is the point. 
He talked all about in terms of the bloody sacrifice, the sacrifice that was made, the bloody sacrifice. This will be a done, done away with. This is just a type and a shadow of things to come. Don't think this, in fulfilling that, you fulfill the law and so forth. <coughs> That's not it at all. It looks forward to another sacrifice. And this is the passage where it talks about that great and last sacrifice, that one sacrifice will just have to be made once. Uh, whether it shall be made in other worlds, that's another thing, of course, that's in the Newtonian hymn, Other Worlds, for their guidance. But we have our guidance, and we have this given for us. But you notice this this puts the atonement way out there, you see. We're, we're nowhere near that league until we've fulfilled all these things. And as long as we're here, we're in a, in a miserable condition of things. That's what we're going to have here. Now, let's look at the main, main points as we go along here. <coughs> in the second chapter, <coughs> first of all, we start out with a very encouraging announcement in the fourth verse. Mm -hmm. Yes, here's a handbook of the atonement. The, uh, I'm thinking of Eliade here. He says, the spirit is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The way is prepared from the fall of man, and salvation is free. The door is wide open. You can go your, you can choose your own pace, and uh, you can advance as you please. It's going to be a very individual thing. And you begin on an upbeat note, you see, the plan is made, it's going to talk about, well, he, well, first of all, the remark here, what this means, there are various things that you might question. What can he possibly be talking about here when he says, he shall consecrate thine afflictions for thy gain. We mentioned that the last time. Uh, this means, of course, you get credit for what you've endured, but then he says, the spirit's the same. You're always going to have the same spirit, and yesterday, today, and forever, the way is prepared for the f since the fall of man and Salvation is free. So that's the first note in this handbook of Intone, the, the gospel. The other world opens out to us. And then the next verse, and you are instructed sufficiently. You will be able to judge for yourself that they know good from evil. You can't escape. Without that, of course, you wouldn't be able to get very far. But that's the important thing. So you don't have to look at the fine print in the law all the time to find what's good and bad. That is a sign of decadence, intrigue, dishonesty, and so forth, when you have to write finer and finer print in the law because you know what's right yourself. Brigham Young, that's why he was so impatient with liars. Oh, he, he, he detested liars. And uh, because they're not necessary, any judge, any person with a little common sense would know what's the right thing and what's the wrong thing to do here. The many stories told about Solomon and so forth. But they know sufficiently good from evil. We don't have to split hairs about it, but you know when you're doing right and when you're doing wrong. The law is given unto men, and by the law is no flesh justified. Uh, you, the law won't justify you. I mean, if you kept the law, you said, I'm justified because I kept the law. No, that won't justify you all the way because laws, there are various laws that are written in various ways, and I say lawyers can make it go any way they want to, and you, they can show you're breaking the law or keeping the law. You're not going to be justified just by the law. For example, you say, I've, I've kept the law. Well, a good example is the, uh, the rich young man. He went to the Lord and asked, what shall I do? to become a follower of you. And he says, uh, have you kept all the commandments? Yes, he says, I have. I've kept them from my youth. Kept all the commandments. So he says, oh, no, you haven't. There's one you haven't kept. You go and sell everything you have and share it with the poor. That's what you do. There's the law of consecration. And that's the law that none of us can take. We get up to there and then we stop. We draw the line there. You're not going to be saved by the law unless you go all the way and that's going to, it's going to deliver you on to a better world then. Meanwhile, we're stuck with it. But See, there's no appeal, and from a sentence of the law, you don't get an appeal anyway. By the temporal law, you're cut off, and also by the spiritual law, and perish from that which is good forever. See, this is for lack of atonement. You have to go beyond that, because merely fulfilling the law, because the point is, we're not capable of doing what is righteous. Man who is born to evil as the, as the sparks fly upward and so forth. I do like Voltaire's story of Memnon, you know, this Lomki Avuluetta Papi Mosage, a man who wanted to be perfectly wise. Every morning he would get up and make a solemn resolve, take, make a covenant, that he would never make any mistakes or do anything unwise that day. Nous trompés dans nos entreprises, c'est à quoi nous sommes faits, I think he ends up. Do we deceive ourselves in all our enterprises? That's what we're made for, that's our very nature. Uh, le matin, je fais des bons conseils. Every morning, I make good resolutions, 
in the long de jour des sorties. And all day long, I just make an ass of myself. Just one blunder after another. You're not going to escape it as long as you're in the flesh. That's what we're here for. That's what this chapter is going to tell us again. You're not going to escape that. And so here we're stuck with it. And just by keeping the law, you're not going to be, because the law is tailored to our own weaknesses and our own usages. See, that's what it is. And the least we can do. And uh, then after that, then you'll be free. But this is the first requirement to sort of get us on the road. The law is called the way. It's very often called the way. You see. The, uh, the way, the two ways, the way of righteousness and the way of darkness. Book of Mormon everywhere. Early Christianity, the doctrine of the two ways is very prominent. So then here, therefore, how great is the importance to make these things known? He says, oh, well, no. The next verse, seventh verse. Uh, Behold, he offereth himself as a sacrifice for sin to answer the ends of the law. And to all those who have a broken heart, see, this is where you come in. You have to be able to accept this. Merely keeping laws and undoing. A broken heart and a contrite spirit, and to none other can the ends of the law be answered. He's talking about the ends of the law, means the set terms of the law. They can't be answered. You can keep the set terms and the ends and, and escape the sentences and so forth. But this is another thing entirely, you notice. A broken heart and a contrite spirit. The court can't test you on that or anything else like that. They can't look into your heart. They have to deal with facts, facts, always with facts, and uh, of course this is silly. Therefore, how great the importance to make these things known, this great gulf between us and reality. There is no flesh that can dwell in the, dwell in the presence of God. That's the question, you see. Now, standing up in the court and getting, and getting cleared by the judge or getting cleared by the jury, that's one thing. But standing in the presence of God, uh, who can see everything, every flaw and everything you have in you, that, that's another thing. We'd rather have the, the rocks and the mountains cover us than have to do that. That's the worst torment we can have. That, that is worse than any hell, you see. Anything but that, you see. Give us hell, I can enjoy hell, but don't let me have to do that. And, no, that's true, that would be the hardest thing we could do, to be out, so completely out of place. See, hell is a place where you're out of place, where, where you don't want to be. And of course, but the worst thing about hell is that you belong there, that you're among your own kind and so forth. Well, anyway, he goes on here. No flesh can dwell in the presence of God, save it be through the merits and mercy and grace of the Holy Messiah. Now, how is this going to be done? He layeth down the flesh, according, his life according to the flesh, and taken it up again by the power of the Spirit, that he may bring to pass the resurrection of the dead. Now, resurrection we cannot achieve at all. This is another thing here. And this is a very important part of it, if we're going to be, carry on the whole thing, you see, is this other life we're concerned about. Uh, that's what the gospel looks for. We have the rules for this life, write a book on the happy life and so forth. Well, it's just careerism as far as that goes. Your career goes up and then it comes down with a bump and that's that. A recent uh, issue came out in, was, I think it was Business Week or was it uh, the Wall Street Journal? No, it was Business Week. Uh, uh, interviews with top executives who uh, retired. All of them, they're broken men. I mean, to go into your office to clean out your desk and have everybody in the office snub you, when the day before you had been top man, absolutely, they were all bowing on their knees and kowtowing, and the next day they say, who's this guy, you see? Uh, that's too much for some to take, and some of them commit suicide. Uh, I could name some that did that. They, they just couldn't take that coming down, but everybody has to come down in the end. You're not, you're not going anywhere here. That's the whole point of our existence here. We've got to think in other terms if we're going to if life is to be endurable, we have to think in other terms. Otherwise, you see, men at times are sober, they think by fits and starts, and when they think, they fasten their hands upon their hearts. As Osman said, you could stay drunk, you could endure this life, but men at times are sober, and then it's just too bad. <laughs> you see the terror of it, but not if we have the gospel. This is the nice thing, because the, the obvious idea that we are preparing for something better, it's very plain here. I wrote something on that yesterday. I'm not going to read it now, though, but it was something here. And so we go on. Uh, wherefore, he is the first fruits unto God. Why is, what do you mean by first fruits? That's the image that the Jews all understood. It means the best you have is the best and most beloved. It is the prize. You can't give anything less, you see. Nothing less than a supreme sacrifice could be made. You can't settle for less here. All men, and, and it is because of intercession, the intercession for all. All men come to God, wherefore they stand in the presence of him, and then after your resurrection, and after everything is done, you still have to be judged, to be judged of him according to truth. Of course, if it was the doctrine of uh, the Lutheran doctrine, Tad lays it all us, Tod lays it all us, the death releases everything, but your, the person's death is his own atonement. Well, if that was the case, there'd be no place for hell, of course. We'd all be equal in the hereafter, which is not so. Of course, we know that. 
<laughs> more than we were here before. Well, and then a law, the Holy One hath given the law, and here is the law, you see, under which if a punishment is affixed. Punishment is opposition to that which is of happiness. Now, this idea of punishment, being bound by punishment rather than by your spontaneous goodwill, it says, is the opposite of the happiness which is affixed to answer the ends of the atonement. You must uh, uh, permanent happiness and exaltation is but after that is the end, the object of the atonement, and to answer that you have to have something better than that. For it must needs be that there is an opposition in all things, and this is an important point. Why? Uh, well, the first law of motion, for one thing, you see, of energy. You know, uh, uh, motion is equal and opposite in direction. Well, it's Newton's first law, actually, that all motion is equal and opposite. See, equal in force and opposite in direction. That's natural. You push in this direction, you're going to have an equal and opposite resistance in the other direction. Well, it's a natural law as far as that goes. And then, without that, we wouldn't have anything. And neither happiness, nor misery, neither sense, nor insensibility. I have some interesting quotations here from the early church fathers on this subject, well, the earliest writers. They make it rather clear, this was a, a popular doctrine before, the idea of uh, that there must be opposition in all things, the right and wrong, as he says in the 13th verse here. If there's no law, then there's no sin to break it, and no sin, there's no righteousness, no righteousness, no happiness. Uh, why the price must be paid. And of course, this, you might call it the, the commercial view of the, uh, which is also a biblical view of the atonement, that a price has to be paid. We've gone into a debt to the Lord, and we can never meet it. Somebody else has, to God and the Father, and uh, somebody else has to pay it. Uh, if you say then that anything you do is all right, uh, that there is no sin, uh, then note the dead, bored, blank faces of people who believe that and practice it. The, the unconcerned liberty, libertine, or the professional killer, he has to cover his serious conscience with a hot iron. If it makes no difference, as it says here, then you have nothing. It, it balances out to exact zero, and there's nothing here. As he says, there's no happiness or anything else. Uh, as soon as people saying, say, well, I can do anything I want to do, it's perfectly clear, God is dead, all is permitted, and so forth. Uh, and the whole structure of society collapses. Nobody is happier. It's pretty horrible, you know. You see this all the time, of course, in your, I say, in your prime time TV and so forth. The scene becomes macabre, as a matter of fact, there, when it becomes absolutely immoral. Now, we, uh, there was a great immoralism in the 17th century. When they, with the sudden enlightenment, they, they decided, I say, God is dead, all is permitted, and so they did all sorts of things. And of course, they were the most bored and disappointed and fearful people in the world. You get that in, in E.T.A. Hoffman, Ernst Theodor Amadeus Hoffman, Tales of Hoffman, things like that. Or you'll get it in... Uh, Oscar Wilde writes things about it, the, the jaded, the you do anything you want. Well, the best example I can always think of is that of, of Septimius Severus, the most successful man perhaps that ever lived. From, from being a sergeant in the army, he became the empire, the emperor of Rome, and the, mo the strongest of all the emperors. I mean, the most ruled over the most and was the mightiest. And as Gibbon says, he was the principal author of the decline of the Roman Empire because he put the military in charge of everything. But and on his deathbed, he'd done everything, you see. He'd achieved everything. So he said, omnia fui et nil expedit. I've been everything, and nothing is worth a damn. He, he was completely... The same thing happened with Diocletian. He was the greatest manager, perhaps, of the ancient times. He managed an empire that was in complete disarray. He put in apple pie order, and it was the whole East and the whole West. It went from Asia right through, all through Europe and Africa and everywhere else, and he put it in perfect, this, this Diocletian. And then in, in 302, he retired to his palace at Spalato and built the palace at Spalato, uh, where everything, uh, this enormous building, the, building, the whole city is inside this palace and so forth, and everything is dedicated to his immortality, trying to achieve immortality. He does everything. He, you find the walls are covered with little putties and victory, uh, victory wreaths and so forth to represent victory over death, and he has he has a tomb exactly like uh, Constantine's tomb with 12 columns, all focusing uh, the power of the apostles. Only he, he was the great Christian persecutor, see Diocletian, he doesn't believe in this. But he has the same si uh, kind of, he's before, this is 20 years before Const uh, Constantine did it. Uh, he has the, 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 uh, the 12 months, the seasons, the moons, of course, concentrating power. His tomb was in the center. It was to act like a burning glass. The life force was to enliven it. Oh, it's the greatest rigmarole you ever saw. My, uh, my daughter's 
father-in-law is the architect who is restoring all this and he spent, I spent some time there and he spends whole days wandering around the palace. Underneath the ground there is a complete duplicate of the palace above. Room for room, passage for passage, closet for closet, everything is exactly as above. He had the three levels, you see, and he was always, he always had these mystic ideas. The point is that these men who reached the heights of success, the high, most successful, were absolutely haunted. They were they were bitter, they were disillusioned, they were everything else. So don't expect that to bring you happiness. Well, that is truism. I don't need to gas on like this. You know perfectly well that that's the way it is, except a lot of people that they don't seem to know it. They seem they talk about uh, success and career and all that sort of, of nonsense. Well, uh, so no happiness. Oh, but I was going to read here from the, uh, from the, uh, oh, I think it's from 82 here. Now, uh, Irenaeus, who came from Ephesus in the early days and in the year 170 became Bishop of Lyon in France. But 170, that's quite early, you see, it's quite soon after the palace, that's Irenaeus. He wrote a very interesting writing on this subject. Uh, Irenaeus, uh, he, that's A-E. He uh, is answering the Gnostics here, and he doesn't give them an answer. He enters up by agreeing with them. The Gnostics had to invent their strange theology to explain the problem of evil. God is either evil because he permits evil to happen or weak because he can't help it. And uh, they had various answers and he had various answers. But it's this problem of good and evil he's talking about, he says. And he says, uh, he calls it the ancient law of liberty. And then he quotes, very properly quotes Matthew 23, 37. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered you under my wing as a hen gathereth her chicks? And you would not. See, I wanted you to. Here's God speaking. I wanted you to, but you wouldn't. He gives them their free will. They don't have to if they don't want to. He's not going to force them. That's what Irenaeus is telling you. For, says Irenaeus, God made man free from the beginning. For God never put the date as 170 on there, A.D. It's quite early, as I say. How often would I... Uh, he says, God made man free from the beginning. For God never uses force. He placed man in power of election, even as in the angels. Glory and honor, he says, to all who do good, and it is due because they could have done evil. It is reasonable enough. Now, if God had made some men good and bad by nature, simply, there'd be nothing praiseworthy in their virtue or blameworthy in their vice. For that being their nature, they could not do otherwise. But since all are given equally the power of doing good or bad exactly as they choose, they are rightly praised or blamed for what they do. That is why the prophets appeal to men to do good and eschew evil. Then he explains, he says, God wants men to do good, of course. But even the gospel allows anyone who doesn't want to do good to do evil. To obey or disobey is in every man's power, God forcing no man. There is a godlike power of judgment in all men, making them envied by the angels. The angels don't have that, uh, don't have as much liberty as, they, as we do because they're in a situation, I mean, in the presence of the Father before you came here, you're not going to have any impulse to commit gross sin. It's only down here that you can get, have a real chance to get tempted, you see. This is the place for it. This is, the, this is really the, uh, the furnace of testing is this earth, because, my gosh, is, is anything right in it, you see. And so, the angels, he says, envy us because we can have a chance to show just how much we can, can overcome, where we can be. So this is the ancient law of liberty. Now, uh, and the very oldest writing, uh, and writing which is turned out to be far more valuable than anyone thought. That is the Clementine Recognitions. Uh, now it's very closely connected with the Dead Sea Scrolls, to everybody's surprise, and it goes right back to the beginnings of Christianity. It's a surprising document, very rich in, in uh, lore from the early church. And it contains the famous debate between Peter and Simon Magus. Now Simon Magus thought he was a Christian, he was a member of the church, but he wanted to run things. He had his own sect and he thought he was greatly inspired and had great ideas about himself, made a lot of trouble. So he has this argument with, uh, with Peter, the famous, it's, it's mentioned in, in Acts. But he, Peter begins the discussion by invoking peace on the whole assembly and expressing the desire that everything, be, they're going to have this big debate, that everything be peaceably and amicably, amicably discussed. This is the signal for the self-righteous Simon Mangus to blow his top. He explodes with an indignant declaration that the champions of truth don't ask for peace since they are determined to kick the stuffing out of error, he says, and will only call it peace when the opposition lies helpless before them. It is weakness and cowardice, says Peter, to ask for peace for the wrong as well as for the right side. 
In reply, Peter says to him, we must imagine this world as a vast plain, a Maidan, as it is in the Book of Mormon. Remember, he sees the vast plain, has that vision, the plain, in which two cities strive for mastery, each claiming the whole land as his own. The king of one city sends to the other proposing a peaceful solution, a discussion, in which the matter might be discussed without killing anybody. He isn't weak, says Peter, not at all. He has no intention of giving the other king a single blade of grass that doesn't belong to him. Now, the other king can think of no other course than to take what is his by force, and that, says Peter, shows that his cause is really a weak one. Simon Magnus then applies his old, this old chestnut of the schools. God is either vicious because he doesn't want to prevent evil, or weak because he cannot. You cannot have evil. He says, we can't tolerate evil. We can't put up with that at all. That's Simon's position. And Peter says, well, look, what are we doing here for? He said, could not God have made us all good so that we could be anything, uh, could not be anything else but virtuous? And that, of course, is what St. Augustine says. Oh, uh, misera necessitas non possa non peccare. Oh, miserable necessity not to be able not to sin. If God had only created us not able to sin, how much happier we would be. And he says it's a miserable necessity to be able to sin is a terrible thing. The way he puts it is even stronger. Not to be able not to sin. If we were not able not if we were not able to sin, then we'd be happy. So he says, Oh misery in the case of us, non possum not to be able uh, not to sin. If we were only able not to sin, and if well, you go round and round, the point is, you see. The fact that we can sin is a terrible calamity. Well, it isn't a calamity at all, as Peter explains here, but Simon Magus thinks it is. And that's basic in Christian theology. I say that's St. Augustine I was quoting. Uh, could God not have made us all good so that we could not be anything but virtuous? And this is exactly what you get here in Nephi, of course, to which Peter replies with a statement of the ancient law of liberty. A foolish question, he said, for if he made us unchangeably and immovably inclined to good, we would not really be good at all since we couldn't be anything else. And it would be no merit on our part that we were good, nor could we give credit for doing what we did by necessity of nature. How can you call any act good that is not performed intentionally? For this reason, the world has existed through the ages. Now, here's the doctrine of pre-existence and probation here, right out of the Book of Mormon again. For this reason, the world has existed through the ages so that the spirits destined to come here might fulfill their number here and make their choice between the upper and the lower words. This is the time of probation. This is the time of proving, as we're often told in the Book of Mormon. And this is the time to prepare. It's all preparation. And here is where you make your choice between the upper and lower worlds, both of which are represented here. And they certainly are. So that when their bodies were resurrected and the blessed might go to eternal light and the unrighteous for their impure acts be wrapped in spiritual flame. That's an interesting statement. And of course, you get the same thing in 10th Hebrews. Yes. Where, where are you getting Oh, I'm getting it from, well, you can go back to Patrologia and get it, or you can get it from this book of mine. <laughs> it's called The World and the Prophets, and it's on reserve. It's on reserve, and this is on page 182, 84, yeah. You can get it there. Uh, and then, in this work, says Peter, every man is given a fair chance to show his real desires. To the question put to him in a later discussion, did not the Creator know that those he created would be evil? Peter replied, certainly. He considered all evil that would be among those whom he created. But as one who knew there was no other way to achieve a purpose for which they were created, he went ahead. Now that is the theme of, a, of an interesting number of, especially Coptic, but recently discovered early Christian documents. Every time you find a very early Christian document discovered, and they've been discovering them now uh, since the World War II, for the first time, we're getting quite a library of them, uh, it usually starts out with the heading, these are the secret teachings of the Lord to the apostles after the resurrection. Well, everybody claimed to have those teachings after. They aren't necessarily so, but the point is that he did give them secret teachings which are not contained in the, in the Bible. We don't know what he taught them. And then their eyes were opened, it says. They understood, not told what he told them. But uh, it claims to be that. But these are teachings that were, were preserved. And see, a Gnostic was a person who claimed to have that knowledge, to have that secret knowledge. It's very well explained in Eusebius, where he quotes Hegesippus, the earliest church historian, who says, as long as I was an apostle, a real eyewitness authority uh, through Christ, that first generation, he said these people lurked in dark corners, as he put it. But as soon as the last witness died, as soon as the last apostle who could call up and call their bluff had died, he said, then they came out like, uh, like bugs out of the woodwork. They came out everywhere. They swarmed. And of course, all of a sudden, there were over a hundred different churches, each claiming that it had the original teaching that the Lord, and that's called the Gnosis. 
It's called gnosis 27 times in the New Testament. Gnosis, that means the knowledge, the knowledge that, the, that you get from the, of the gospel, the higher knowledge, this sort of thing. And these people all have to have it, and they're always referred to in the New Testament as Gnostics so-called, always hyphenated. Gnostics, they call themselves Gnostics. That doesn't mean they are. But the point is people knew about this, that this information existed, and anyone who claimed to have it could count on getting a following, because they were looking for that when the lights went out. Looking for that, it was, it was taken away. But here, these, uh, he considered, well, this is, this is typical. I was going to say, the council in heaven is quite a theme here. I'm thinking especially as that doctrine of the Abiton. Uh, by Bishop Cyril of Alexandria. But I won't go into that, but the, the accounts of the Council in Heaven are, when the creation was proposed, uh, they vo it was voted down, because the earth complained that you would be defiled, and the people all decided up there uh, that there'd be too much suffering, too much wickedness, too much defilement. You're not going to create this world. And there was a deadlock, and they didn't know what to go on until one person volunteered and said, I will pay the price. I will. I will take the blame. And you know who that was. And when they did that, the whole chorus broke out when the morning stars shouted for joy and all the uh, shouted together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. That was the famous creation hymn. See, our word poem comes from creation hymn. The, the, the poem was the original creation hymn, the hymn that was, was sung in the heavens to announce the glory of the creation. All the earliest poems are. The, the Greek poema means, see, poema means a creation. It, it was the creation hymn. The muses first sang it together with the Greeks and so forth. And you have many references to that. But they broke out on that hymn because it was the Lord that made it possible to go on with the creation and carry this out and allow this to happen. Even in spite of all this wickedness and corruption, he would pay the price. And only one other person could clean up that mess, you see. And he would do it. So it says here, he considered that evil would be among those whom he created, but as one who knew there was no way to achieve the purpose, he did not draw back or hesitate, nor was he afraid of what would happen. Evil is forced on no one, he says. It is only there for those who want it. No one comes under its sway, say he, save he who of his own free will will deliberately subject himself to it. And then an interesting thing happens. Uh, at this time, uh, Simon Magnus loses his temper, and he starts to rave and to rant and say how great he is. And Peter's good faith in this law of liberty was put to the test then, because Simon lost control of himself and started raving and antagonizing and scandalized everybody there because he misbehaved so. And the people wanted to mo mob Simon Magus because he was making, he had made so much trouble and so forth. But Peter immediately stood up and opposed him. He says, absolutely nothing doing. What are we talking about the law of liberty for if we can't let Simon do what he wants? He says, we must bear with wicked men with patience, brethren, knowing that God could easily wipe them out, suffers them to carry on to the appointed day in which the deeds of all shall be judged. Wherefore should we not then suffer whom God suffers? Why do we not bear the fortitude of spirit, of, with fortitude of spirit, the wrongs they commit against us, when he who can do all things does not avenge himself for the wrongs they do to him? Uh, now, it has always been the concern of despots. This is uh, speaking of... Uh, of Needham's book, when the emperors took over, then they made the law. Anybody who does wrong will be killed, and that's all there is to it. And wrong is what we define as wrong. But the, now, this reached its supreme in Theodosius in 395 with the Theodosian Code. The first emperor went overboard all Christian. He went farther than, than Constantine or anybody else. But he made it a crime to, to own a Hebrew Bible, for example. A capital crime, it's fine, and that was responsible for a lot of wiping out of text, you can imagine. Or any literature uncomplimentary of the Christians to possess that uh, was a capital offense. So there was a great destruction of books and records and everything else under Theodosius. He wanted to make the world good. Well, wasn't that a, a commendable project as far as that goes? In every age, it's been their purpose to prevent and punish trespasses against God. I don't mind about myself, but it's against God that I mind. It's, this is the, the thing that, that's always being used, you see. Uh, those sins which shake the very foundation of the universe, according to established dogma. You get some wonderful things. Uh, uh, Donatus or uh, uh, Caliaris, who is it? Uh, oh, Lucifer of Caliaris. <laughs> Caliaris, <laughs> put some marvelous things on that. <laughs> Or John Chrysostom, even the great Chrysostom. You'd be surprised how far they go in insisting that everybody be righteous or else, you see. And uh, because all sin is wrong, any sin against wrong, is God is absolutely wrong, and anyone who does any wrong should be absolutely 
Uh, death is much too good for them and so forth. Sin is wrong, therefore all possible means should be taken to prevent men from sinning. Isn't that logical enough? What could be more logical? From the earliest to the latest times, kings have claimed to be what the Roman Emperor called himself virtutum rector, the rector in charge of virtue, and of course he did appoint the, uh, well, they'd had from the days of the Republic, uh, they'd had sumptuary laws, and, uh, but they had the, they had the, uh, the officials, what they call them, to go around and correct people's morals. And uh, he was the ma Magnus Parents Mundi. He was the great parent of the world who was responsible for the world's, for the world's morals. And, uh, uh, you know, I'll think of those officers that went around correcting people's virtue. The kings of old always had an answer to that, you say, that uh, usurping divine authority, who are you to judge and, and put God's law uh, at your disposal? You can use it, you see, to give you authority for anything you want to do. They'd say, we are God's representatives on earth, and whatever we do, it, after all, is the name of virtue. We want everyone to be virtuous. And it is our business to see that everybody is virtuous. I'm quoting from somebody there, as a matter of fact. And uh, in this, they were quite sincere. And remember, that was Satan's plan. He didn't want to damn anybody. He wanted to make everybody virtuous. He didn't command Cain to sacrifice to the devil or anything. I don't know, he says, sacrifice to the Lord. He wanted, he wanted the gospel plan to go through as long as he was in charge, you see. He told Adam and Eve to do a thing that had been done in other worlds. They were, they were expected to eat that fruit, as a matter of fact, but in telling them to do it, in obeying, getting them to obey him, see, that was the whole point. They were taking orders from him, and that's what he wanted. He wants to run the whole thing. He used any guys, any trick he can do, is to tell a thousand truths, as Joseph Smith said, to put over one error, and then you see how that confounds everything. No, the thing is, he wants to be in charge. Remember, he introduces himself at the beginning of the book of Moses. He says, I am the only begotten, worship me. And he has a, he stamps on the ground and he rages and rants as a five-star tizzy because he wants to be worshipped. He wants to run things. That's his desire. He is ambitious. And his plan was to make everybody virtuous, not vicious. And he was the model of the archetype of those monarchs of old who insist on banishing all sin by edict. Time and again, the panegyrists hail this or that emperor as having abolished all sin and nonconformity from the world. Gone was against sin very well. The emperor would see it that nobody sinned. Uh, emperors, since sincere and devout men, gave themselves such names as Pius and Felix, titles later adopted by the popes, <coughs> sent out their Agentus in Rebus, and they went out, that isn't the name I was trying to think of, but that, the other goes way back to the old Republican times. The, the Agentus in Rebus, that was their virtue. The business was to spy and teach virtue and morals, especially uh, to the Christians. Everybody knew their immoral doctrines and secret orgies. And they met with us a rebuff. Minucius Felix says, what a splendid sight to God when a Christian stands up to pain, when he holds his own against threats, tortures, and torments, when he smilingly faces the multitude screaming for his death and the grim preparations of the butcher, he asserts his liberty against kings and princes, yielding only to God to whom it belongs. It's not for kings or princes to judge whether a man's course is godly or not. It's for God alone, you see. So, uh, Well, hands off and so forth. Then we talk about the, uh, the Constitution and other things that has to do with that. Yes, uh, God does not delegate to any man or institution the functions reserved for himself and so forth. So, so, let's go back to the Book of Mormon, which is talking along these lines. And uh, second chapter, first Nephi. Well, the next thing, first we had the spirit is the same, it's free, it's open, salvation is free, and then you're instructed, you have sufficient knowledge, <coughs> so forth, and uh, to carry on, that you can be judged. With that law of good and bad, of course, we can make laws, and we make laws, but we have to make them for everything we do. The spirit isn't in you. If you don't know what's right, all the laws in the world aren't going to help. But, as I say, we're very litigious. We use it, of course, as a means of controlling wealth. But there is the atonement, which requires the broken heart and contrite spirit, and then the resurrection and standing in judgment. And there must needs be an opposition in all things. And then, and then, otherwise, if this wasn't so, all things must vanish away. Of course, that's the, the heat death. It is referred to in the ninth chapter back here. He refers to entropy, or the heat death, uh, back here somewhere, where he talks about, I think it's in the ninth chapter, maybe seventh verse. Uh, well, oh, here it is. 
It is in the ninth chapter, in the seventh verse. I was right, haha. -ha. Only I was looking at the wrong page. There must needs be an infinite atonement. How it's going to cover everything? Because of that good old second law, that law of entropy, the heat death. Everything runs down. Heat can only move from a hotter to a cooler body, and that's all. And when it finally has distributed itself evenly, then there's nothing. Then there's everything is nothing. Things must have vanished away and so forth. And it says here, it's the same thing. The more complex materials always break down to the more simple. Well, by theory then, the more complex shouldn't have existed by now. They should have vanished long ago, but they haven't. And this is a great puzzle now to scientists today. They talk a lot about it. It has to be an infinite atonement. Wherefore, the first judgment which came upon man must needs have remained an endless duration. And this is what happened. He says, when you die, you die dead. That's the normal thing. What is happening here is a mind far greater than inert matter has intervened and is running things. But it's got to take the intervention of something because in the normal case of things, this is what happened. If so, this flesh must have lain down to rot and to crumble to its mother earth to rise no more. Well, that's entropy. That's real. It rots, it crumbles, it falls, it comes and reaches a dead level, and that's the end. Nothing rises anymore. But there is something which has interfered with the whole process. There are minds. There is something greater than, than chance and inert matter, as far as that goes. See, this is an important thing. It's, it's quite an issue, I say, among scientists today. There, there's a, a new book out by a woman called Carolyn Merchant, a very good one, called The Death of Nature. Very interesting book. She is a, uh, a biologist at, uh, at Harvard. So, the, uh, oh, well, we're talking about that's what happens, but we have something much better than that, of course, in the, in the atonement. So, that's the second verse. So we go on, and this is very nice, this part. I like this an awful lot. Notice here, we go on. There must needs be that there was an opposition, the one being sweet, the other bitter. And then the 16th verse, wherefore the Lord God gave unto man that he should act for himself. He's repeating. And you're enticed by the one and the other, and you're enticed equally in either direction, as, uh, as we're told in the seventh chapter of, of uh, Moroni. He says that, remember? The devil enticeth and inviteth in one direction. At the same time, God inviteth and enticeth in the other. And you're pulled between two orbits. Which way you go depends on you. You'll decide which, which one you'll follow. Neither one is overpowering, uh, can't, is irresistible, because if that was so, then you wouldn't be responsible. You'd, be, you'd say it is stronger than I, say, put forth, come on, you have to yield. That's not so. But Satan here, this old rascal, is seeking the misery of all mankind. Well, somebody is doing it, and somebody's doing an awfully good job. And the 21st verse here, the days of, ch of the children of men were prolonged according to the will of God that they might repent. That's good, that gives me another day. Hooray, hooray, and I'll need it. Uh, but we must repent, you see, and uh, we're going to, this is very important, after all, if we are so completely involved in the things of this world, as we necessarily are, we're never clear unless we make our first step and repent and decide we'd, we'd prefer to move in another direction. We, uh, uh, repentance is, a, is a, a file of intention to, to change your way, but you have to keep repenting. Remember, we talked about repentance before. You, and, of course, therefore, it's a state of probation. You always have a chance to repent. It's not too late, you see. And their time was lengthened to give you more time to repent. This is the greatest thing you can have. Remember, as Irenaeus says, the angels don't have the capacity either to, uh, don't have the capacity to repent. They don't have the choice. It makes us envied of the angel because we can always do better and we can repent, make the resolve. All men must repent. For he showed unto all men that they were lost. And of course, with the fall, we are lost. I mean, and that, that isn't just a myth. Oh, I see the time's up now. Everybody who's ever thought about the human race has come to that conclusion. Oh, the human race mentioned to Mr. Aachen Krach. In Bewusstsein seiner Werder sitzt der Kater auf dem Dach. That's Hidegai Gai, he's a cat. It reflects upon the foolishness and the wickedness of men. And Hidegai Gai is always right, you know. <laughs> With his worth, the, the cat sits on the road and said, mention to him, the human race is nothing but, but a mess. Or, uh, as, as the Quran says, dunya uh, khasara, this world is just loss. It's, it's nothing. I mean, because everything, that law of second dynamics we just mentioned, because everything's going to run down. Everything, we're fighting it all the time, and it beats us. You can't beat gravity. Look at me. You see, I'm sagging at all points now, because I'm sorry, gravity's going to take over. That's what you do. Isn't it nice that there's something that intervenes, and there, there's more to come, you see? So that's what we have here. All men must repent, because they're all lost. And they must have remained so to no end. See, there's your no entropy at all, you see. Must have remained whatever they are, you see. And... Therefore, they could have had no children. They would have remained in a state of innocence, having no joy, for they knew no misery, doing no good, for they do, knew no sin, just as we read there from, 
from uh, Irenaeus and from Peter. The uh, Well, so is passing the test enough? No, it isn't. We must repent continually. You never pay the full price because, of course, you can't, even from day to day. Atonement is absolutely necessary. Re repentance once is not enough. And why? Uh, just what is the mechanism of repentance? How is it done? How does atonement work? And so forth. This is the thing that escapes everybody. Let's see if it escapes us. Of course, we have more to say. Oh, and then here's the most famous passage in the Book of Mormon. Next verse. Time to quit ending. Adam fell that we might be. That's so that we can be. And men are, this is the bottom line, that they might have joy. Now, that's the 25th verse. And how do you define joy? That's one of those things where you can't define anything that's really important, can you? They're redeemed, you have to be redeemed from the fall. The Messiah cometh in the fullness of time that he may redeem the children of men from the fall. Being redeemed, they're free forever, knowing good from evil to act for themselves. They can move in all directions. Free, all things are given to them that are expedient to man, and they are free to choose liberty and eternal life through the great mediation of all men, or to choose captivity and death according to the captivity and power of the devil. For he seeketh that all men might be miserable like unto himself. Now, my sons, I would that you should look to the great mediator. Now, the one, see, that we need that one. We have to have the mediator when we talk to him. Do not choose eternal death according to the will of the flesh, the evil which is therein. See, the will of the flesh, the laws of nature, that is, you see, that is running down. That is second law, entropy, and so forth. That will give the spirit, the devil, power to captivate. Well, what about the spirit? It doesn't run down. Ah, yes. But what is it? It's subject to the devil after that, and this will be... Uh, a terrible thing to have happen. Well, that, uh, so that second chapter is, is a very hard one, actually, and the, the third one is a genealogical chapter, which is an, an interesting one, too. Uh, I see we're not going very fast, but I find out that other people aren't going much faster, so that's good. And uh, there's, enough, there's enough nourishment here, there's enough meat to keep us guessing, isn't there?